Yet we encounter government every single day, whether we're students in the classroom, teachers in the classroom, no matter what education system you're going through, you have to get accredited by accrediting institutions who have acknowledgments by the states. The states run the education systems and the local governments do. If you want to get a job, occupations are regulated by the government. In a lot of cases, you have to get licensed by the government. If you want to open a business, you have to deal with all levels of government. You fill up your car with gas, you go to the grocery store, you're dealing with government. Every aspect of our life involves government. And yet, we don't teach it like that. Why isn't it a required course separated out from history? Because politics and government is different, actually, from history. They piggyback off each other. They are different. But why aren't students learning about government each and every day? Why, when I bring up Article 5, my students look at me dumbfounded that they never even heard of, of Article 5 in the Convention of States? Why, when they look at the Russian Constitution, think it's the American Constitution? The Russian Constitution, has, it, it's a long document, but I cut it down to about five pages. But it has 17 articles. Our Constitution has seven. That's it. We are one of the youngest countries in the world with the oldest codified constitution in the world. You have civilizations that have existed for a thousand years. Thousands of years. Yet our constitution is the only constitution that has survived. Why is that the case? That hasn't been thrown away. It hasn't been changed constantly. Why? Because there are mechanisms that have been put in place. Because our constitution is a mechanics guide to how our government operates. Our constitution is the one constitution that actually constrains governmental power, limits governmental power. Our Constitution is the one Constitution that says what the government cannot do, even though they do it anyway. <laughs> but you look at other Constitutions around the world, their Constitutions empower their governments. And we're losing it all because we don't know our Constitutions. And because the bureaucrats that have been there for 40, 50 years have taken advantage I would love to give them my constitutional test. Imagine how many of them would fail that. Imagine. Oh, I should give it to Governor Holt. Um, how long has COS existed? And have there been any states that have gotten to that point of passing the legislation? Yes. Yeah, there are many states that have actually passed convention states. What's the exact one? Passed in 19. 19? Yeah, we passed in 19. And uh, we've been around for 10 years. Okay. Are these three separate amendments, or are these going to be combined into one? No, they would serve as three separate amendments. And it doesn't mean that these would be the Convention of States that gets proposed. If we're doing limited Convention of States, um, you know, you may only get term limits. And, and I'm talking about very limited term limits. Or you may only get fiscal restraint rules, very limited. And so that's why the idea of a runaway convention is a joke. It's not going to happen. And, and just to feed off what the discussion was moments ago, 1972-73, yeah. Fort Richmond High School stopped teaching civics because I never got into any of the classes. That was something I looked forward to, but they were just gone. Um, then when I was in the Army as a platoon sergeant, I was aghast at the fact that my privates had no clue as to how our government worked. And I would then take time, you know, in the afternoons and the evenings, we have a whole little series of things. But these are all people that signed up to the military, wrote a check to the government, signing away their lives, and they had no idea as to how the government that was going to send them into harm's way actually worked. And listen, I'm not surprised. I mean, you know, and it's not just my students. I gave a speech to a corporation that has over 2,000 employees with it. And prior to the speech, I made them take the same constitutional exercise that my students have taken. Only they actually had it easier. Because my students, the, the, the citizenship exam I give them is fill in the blank. Because it's easy questions. Who is the Speaker of the House? And who has the power to declare war? What branch of government? Who's the father of the Constitution? So it's fill in the blank. When I gave it to this corporation, it was multiple choice. And guess what? The results were the same. <laughs> they did better on one question. I forget what the question was, but they did better on one question compared to my students. But still, 86% of them failed the citizenship exam. 90% of them couldn't identify and differentiate between the American from the Russian Constitution. So it shows you it's not limited by age. But the problem is, 
that the youth are extremely important because they're the future leaders. We don't treat them as if they're the future leaders. And now we live in this bizarre time where it's popular or fashionable to bash the United States, to denigrate the United States, to denigrate our founding, say that the country was built just simply in sin and slavery, and that was it. That was the sole purpose of it. That's right. Well, how, how many people are going to have a loyalty to the country if they think their country was just simply founded in sin? And we're seeing the results of this. We're seeing the effects. Patriotism is that 37% of people believe patriotism is important in our society. Without patriotism, you don't have a country. And this is the fear that I have that's going on. We're seeing our Constitution and the Founding Fathers get decimated in classrooms around the country. And unfortunately, there's not enough people that are standing up and speaking out about this. Listen, this is a country that's not free from sin. Our Constitution is not some perfect document. We have our flaws. But we've tried to advance as a society to create this more perfect union. We recognize the sins that we've committed, and we admit that publicly. We teach it. More people, more students know about slavery and things like the trail of tears in my classroom than they do about the Constitution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just want to uh, give a lot of props to Commissioner States for being like a uh, you know, leader as in terms of uh, actually making the amendment happen. I hope with other groups like Wolf Pack, they actually moved back from having five states agreed to their amendment to only four, whereas you guys are kicking ass over halfway from 19 states already involved. One of the challenges they talked about was having someone with the balls to be the first one to actually sign. A lot of people, they said even Lee Zeldin was willing to sign uh, an amendment, but he didn't want to be the first one up. But I could even have someone today who's from Staten Island the first one to step up. What are the other challenges, right? I see a citizen, uh, um, what do they call it? A citizen's audit. But they're doing a lot of essential work to uh, examine, you know, um, election fraud, things like that going on that can affect our ability to uh, get this change. Well, we have the most perfect and secure elections. What are the main things, like, I'm really excited to be a part of the New York team, but New York is not on the, on, the, uh, on the list yet, and I want to get them there. What are the number one things holding us back? I see you guys already breaking ground with uh, someone who's ready to, to be the first one there. Big props on that, a lot of groups struggle with that. What else do we really need to get this going? So, uh, I'll explain two things. One, the election quicker, quick, and then New York. Because Congressman Zeller, former Congressman Zeller, he actually made major advances in this election for the governorship compared to previous Republicans that ran. And I don't want to make it a Republican Democrat thing. Okay? I think both parties are part of a problem. And there are some that act as statesmen, you know, like the Rand Pauls of the world, that will put principle and do what's in the best interest of the United States rather than just go along with talking points and everything. But when we look at it in New York, you know, the idea of elections and citizens' order. When we say that there was the safest, most secure election, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of, of voting systems or anything like that. I don't have to go down that rabbit hole. All I have to say is we switched the mechanism of voting six months before an election. Our entire way that we have voted for decades, for over 100, 200 years, was switched. And it was flawless. If you believe that, you got a bridge to sell you. Okay, we're talking about a government, New York State government, that can't even fix a pothole correctly. <laughs> and, and we're supposed to pretend that there wasn't anything wrong? And then you look at it, and, and the way it was done, I mean, you know, when we had the primaries prior to the general election, there were 400,000 ballots from one district in Manhattan were thrown out, invalidated, because they didn't, weren't filled out correctly. And yet, all in the 2020 election were just approved, and not probably anything got thrown out. That's bizarre. The numbers don't drive. Even in normal election times, we see a 3% ballot rejection rate. This election was like 0.6% or 0.7%. I don't remember the exact number. But, but it's full volume. Now, what do we need to do in New York? I, I go around the state criticizing and bashing both political parties. But I, I focus a lot on Republicans, because Republicans have. Why have Republicans fail? Well, because they've abandoned areas. They haven't gone into areas for decades because we can't win those areas. And so we're not going to get involved in those areas. We're not going to talk to the people from those areas. Yet. Something that we need to do, forget a political party label, something that we need to do is not speak to people who agree with you. Speak to the people that may actually have an open mind. Yeah. I, I go around.
around to places where they are, they don't believe in limited government like I do. Let's just say that. But all I'll do is ask questions. I'm not a big believer in dictating to people that disagree with me because it, it, the second that I start dictating to them, they're tuning me out. They're not listening to me. The second I, I criticize the president and just name call, they're tuning me out. They're not listening. So what I'll do is I'll just ask questions. Are you happy with the addition to the state? No. Do you like traveling on any of the roadways of the state? No. Do you like the tolls that you're paying? Do you like this new idea of the rush hour taxes that can be thrown on you that when you, you drive into certain areas? The congestion taxes? No. Are you satisfied with your communities and, and, and the homeless population? No. And everything's no, 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 no. And then I just plant seeds. Who's in power again? What party controls what? Oh, it doesn't. Oh, you don't need a single Republican vote to get anything through. So, you can't sit there and say, well, Republicans are equally responsible because they don't do anything. And, no, they have no power whatsoever. And so it starts to open people's eyes. They, they start, and listen, there's going to be the bomb throwers. If someone's sitting there and they're hardcore ideological, don't waste your time with them. But there are so many people that aren't. And, and, I, and we should be going into communities that have been long ignored. Maybe if you went into those communities, you start winning 5 to 10%. Well, then you'll start winning the election. Then you'll start winning legislative seats on the state level. Then you can win the governorship. Then you can get maybe the, the COS legislation through. And I think that's the kick. The next election is going to be bigger. Because I do think that New Yorkers are getting fed up. I mean, if you look at what Zelda lost by, that was the amount of New Yorkers that left New York State. Yeah. Had they not left New York State, he yeah. could have actually won. Awesome. Yeah. And so when we look at that, it's been positive. Uh, I, I guess I'm looking at that say about what you just said. I mean, I'm going to agree with 100% with what I'm saying. I'm a disbeliever. Before you know, I got handcuffs in my, in my hands. He's from Upper Manhattan. Uh, I'm, 
I'm just, I, I want to I mean, reiterate this crazy. issue. Let's it's please stop I mean, pretending we're all against are going to win. It's a huge Correct. Cost. They're not. 6.8 million Democrats in this state, 2.5 million Republicans. It's almost 3 to 1 Democrat to Republican. We're losing 300,000 New Yorkers every single year. Most of them are Republican voters. A Republican has not won a statewide election in this state in 22 years. Nothing. Not governor, not senator, not AG. Nothing. Pataki was the last one 22 years ago. Please do not think the Republican Party is going to help you. Go in, look for independents, look for people who don't care, look for people unregistered, look for others. Republican Party is not going to help you in this state. No, they help it. Let's be clear. This, this thing can be flipped, but I, I can't do it by myself. Well, I'm not Merlin the sorcerer. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a magician either. But if I get help from the New York uh, County Republic Party, yeah. we can flip. I don't know why we can flip. We can do it. Yeah. Well, so I mean, look at it. it. You have six media companies control 94% of the media fund. Six companies. That's it. Control 94% of the media. So that right there is a problem. The second problem, as you say, the state GOP apparatus has been an abysmal failure. Why? Because they're more concerned uh, about keeping their positions of power. And it's become a big problem. And, and, and unfortunately, it's led to failures. Now, we are seeing Republican groups crop up outside of the GOP, in a sense. We're seeing local Republican clubs being built out of in all different areas. We're seeing Gavin Wax and what he's doing with the New York Democratic so we are seeing a lot of changes going on. We are going to get your ass But it takes time. And unfortunately, the GOP and even the ordinary GOP, we don't have the activist base that other groups have. Okay? They are activists. They are trained activists. Many of them are actually funded by taxpayers, which shouldn't be the case. And they know how to get out people to vote. My argument is, if you don't talk to people that disagree with you, you're not going to win elections. You're not going to win them over, and you're not going to win elections. And that's the biggest problem. We like speaking to echo chambers. We like speaking to people that already agree with us and validate our opinions. That's not working, and it's not going to work. But that's the mindset of the GOP, and every level, local, state, and the federal GOP. Given that uh, you spoke about the states being invested in federal funding and they can represent their budget, then you have an amendment that they have to put through to, through the resolution that will say that they're going to lose their funding. So does it make more sense to get the term limits in and then have the new Congress put that in rather than have these states that get a lot of money have to cut themselves funding? Well, again, when you petition to have a convention for a limited scope on these three topics, there is agreement with states that the federal government does need to cut spending. Nobody has said it's going to cut the grants that are going to states, yeah, it's balanced budgets in other ways. The states know that the budget gets cut. Correct. But when you look at it, uh, most people are unaware. I mean, it's New York State, so it's a little different. There are many state legislative bodies that are actually unpaid positions in, in other states, if you go to them. They get a stipend for their service. They only meet once every other year still. Um, so you're talking about in other states, they see the money flows in, in New York State. Uh, how would that go down? I can't answer that question. But yeah, it's a problem, and it's going to be difficult getting agreement. But if you have a limited convention, perhaps you'll find agreement on fiscal restraint. And if there is no agreement, if there is no amendment that could go back to the states, then so be it. At least we'll get term limits made. I, I, I At least we'll limit jurisdiction, federal jurisdiction. I think jurisdiction. having fiscal restraint be on the, the headline of it, right? Presented in equality with the term limits, turns off all the blue people. Catching the states like, uh, like you said, you expect it to be all Republican. That's how Democrats see it as a like, far right, crazy Republican thing. No, and that's but, great. But none of us are that here. We're not a bunch of Nazis, whatever they, whatever they call us. But you know, when you see the fiscal restraints, they just say, like, oh, you want everyone to be squalor. But if you say, do you want to get rid of Mitch McConnell? <laughs> as much as we yes. want to get rid of Chuck Schumer, then you have agreement. When you start putting fiscal restraints in the front of it instead of after on the Congress, 
I think it's, it's not mainstream. It's, it's a lot of well, actually, you'd be surprised at the polling when it comes to federal spending. The, the polling shows that the majority of both Democrats and Republicans actually support reigning in the federal spending. Now, when you get to what programs yeah. are going well, to Democrat, be Democrat, means public military. That's all it is. But when you get it, well, I mean, Republicans are also part of the problem. They say you spend more on defense, and there's a lot of waste. But when you see the polling, there's actually agreement that the federal government needs to be reined in with its spending. And, that, and that's one of the beauties. It, it crosses party lines. And obviously, if you start attacking Social Security and Medicare, that's going to be the most controversial. Well, that's not getting through a, a committee. We already spoke about it in the simulation. And there, there wasn't many Republicans that had the stomach or the support for that. You do need to tackle those programs, but we're talking about a limited scope here. Remember, states have to operate within a balanced budget. It doesn't mean at the end of the year it's going to be balanced, but every year the state has to pass a balanced budget. That's constitutional law. It's in every state constitution. Why should the federal government be any different? Again, unless it's an emergency, which then we understand. So I think there would be some support. Now, if you can't get universal agreement at the convention when it goes back, that's a different story. But that proves the point that you don't have to worry about a runaway convention. Uh, you had Make this uh, the last uh, question uh, so we could uh, kind of wrap it up. I have a question in the form of question. How do you feel about the concept of student government in relation to this being a part of the curriculum mandatory in education? Student government is essential. I mean, you know, when we look at student government, student government runs a lot of things on college campuses, and you look at student government, and it's perfect outreach to try and inform the student body of the different mechanisms that exist. Uh, but part of our problem is that in certain campuses, not all, like, yes, most college campuses are definitely far or low, okay? But there are a lot of them. Go to a community college. Community colleges are not radical like the FOIA university system. When you go to a community college, the, the student body is actually reflective of our country as a whole. 40% being Republican or conservative, 40% being Democrat or progressive, 20% have their head buried in the sand, have no idea what's going on, they're the happiest people out of everyone. Uh, but start there to start recruiting people to, to join causes, it, it's actually a good idea. <laughs> um, I think... Haley, did you want to say yeah, something? Say Go ahead. Go right ahead. Okay, one more. Yes. Hi, I'm Jared Allen. I'm a native Staten Islander. I left 20 years ago. I'm a district captain, District 17 in New Jersey. I got a chance to our state meeting in long term.
classes. And oh, by the way, he joined Sue West. They've got it. The education at Sue West is incredible. I came to the Fed in America, and, 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 and the education rivals the way I used to teach me. Just, just for full disclosure, you join this organization, let me tell you, these people know what they're doing. They're organized, they have a system. I, I, I was really upset. You're talking about those still comments? Well, oh, to his face. But I, I just want to say, because I think this is really important. If a convention of states is called, think of the message that that sends down to me. Even if nothing gets done at a convention of states, think of the message that sends down to the rest of the state. That sends to every member of Congress that we are working to take the country back. And I think just getting a convention. Hell, even if no amendments get through, right. I think that alone would be a success in and of itself, Absolutely. and that we could build upon. I, I just want to reiterate exactly that. Take my thumb here. I think this is great because even if nothing comes from it at the end, the fact that we're moving, what what people who are in charge care about is not us, but they care about their own power. Yep. Yep. And if they feel like their power is being in any way threatened, they'll act. They There's just something in some way to save their own power, probably help it just in the long run by mistake, but just to get your own power to do it. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm aboard, even if it doesn't work. That's the beauty of the state versus the federal. Yes. Because the state wants its power back. Right. Yep. Really, that's leveraging the state that's right. to take power back. That's right. The federal government did not create the states. The states created the federal government. Yep. Yes. And I, that's the beauty is, is you, you're acting at a, not a local level,